Okay, uh, 大家早哈。Good morning, everybody. We are very pleased to invite uh, Professor Andreas Kinker uh, to give a talk. Uh, we say that uh, good friends far from uh, the other country. Uh, this would be very great because uh, Professor Andreas Kinker also engaged in the study of the risk governments and uh, post-normal science. And uh, today she will also uh, explore the methodology we call the uh, cosmopolitan uh, uh, methodology called cosmopolitan. And uh, this, this to say, this to the way to the global uh, governments of, of the uh, cosmopolitan governments. I think uh, since 2018, Taiwan encounters a lot of challenge. Uh, since the, the former uh, President Trump actually launched the uh, Sino-American uh, technological war or the trade war, uh, Taiwan status uh, would be reminded, particularly uh, by the COVID-19, by the climate change, or by the chip. Okay, so uh, when the whole world we uh, find Taiwan. How can we Taiwan actually refine ourselves to conform what, what the Taiwanese contribute to the world? So today the issue including the risk governance or methodological cosmopolitanism is to say if Taiwan in the near future can contribute to the world, to the global uh, world, to the global governance, uh, we would actually uh, to redefine to really confirm uh, our status, our contribution, and also this is better uh, defense, uh, besides uh, war defense. This kind of uh, uh, contribution uh, to the world, I think is the uh, uh, best strategic defense uh, for Taiwan to the world. I will talk 那現在全世界的就短電回流那都會來投資台灣那另外一個是 来这个对全球，当我们这一方面的表现更好的话，啊，除了国防上的这个一战之战的这个防卫之外，哈，最重要是我们对全球贡献更多，我们就更更强的这个全球的盟友。我想这个是非常重要，哈。Okay, so uh, today uh, we have the two discuss discussion. The first discussion is Professor Hermin Xiu, uh, who will uh, later come. The second uh, discussion is Dr. Yang Ziyuan. Okay, so uh, uh, so we will uh, uh, welcome Professor uh, Andrew Splinter. Please give a big hand. Good morning. Oh, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, ladies and gentlemen, your colleagues. Uh, it's I'm very thankful for the invitation to the Risk Society and Policy Research Center here at the National Taiwan University. It's a great pleasure and an honor to visit you and have a chance to talk and give a lecture here about one of my research topics as well as having some exchange with you and some discussions about our shared academic interests and research activities, especially also what uh, Kian uh, also already mentioned about the project, which is a new project for me on methodological cosmopolitanism. But today uh, I talk a little bit more about something which is a kind of research that started almost 20 years ago and made a lot of advancement over the years. So, and I want to give you my, my newest insights into that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think um, and this is my first slide.
we are currently facing an ethical uh, transformation, an ethical change. We experience the onset of a radical ecological, uh, social, cultural, and political transformation at almost all social political levels, and which is, I think, indeed comparable to this great, what we know as these great transformations, namely the Neolithic Revolution and the Industrial Revolution. And Ulrich Beck forecasted the contours of this uh, radical transformation as the, as the metamorphosis of the world in his latest uh, book some years ago. Well, this radical transformation is accompanied by a series uh, uh, of old and new uncertainties and risks of environmental, political, social, economic, and technological uh, nature that are inevitably interwoven. And this is particularly reflected, I think, in the issues and unmet needs in terms of the domestic and international governance of global complex social material systems and their interplay. And I use here the term global social material systems uh, according to the British sociologist John Murray, because these systems are neither solely physical or material, nor they are uh, solely social or political, because they are uh, interrelate the natural world with the social world. So many different sectors are interrelated here that affect our life. And typical examples for me are the climate system, including uh, the energy uh, uh, issues, the biological diversity, but also world economy or even world politics. And I think there is an awareness in the academic world, especially in political science and in political sociology, dealing with domestic and international um, politics, but also in part in actual governments and political systems, that the conventional approaches that we have of democratic governance and decision-making and regulation are often undermined by long-lasting fragmentariness, lack of coordination, inefficiency, and effectiveness. And we have a series of uh, empirical studies and, and that shows us that uh, uh, results in that way uh, at the domestic and international level. And these problems exist at the domestic levels as well as especially also at the international and global level. And recently, I think we could observe directly uh, these shortcomings and deficiencies, um, in particular in the context of the global COVID pandemic. But also we see it right now, and this is, uh, I just uh, observed and uh, had the chance to participate that yesterday in the implementation of CO2 reduction um, goals, also in climate change policy, we have these problems and in the, more generally in the decarbonization of our societies. And there is this uh, Andreas Reckwitz, who is a very prominent and maybe one of the best sociologists at the moment in Germany, who advises Chancellor uh, Scholz and the cabinet in Germany. And he said at the end of the COVID pandemic about one year ago in a TV interview and, and also in a political newspaper that we need a new approach to risk politics, a new approach towards much more forward-looking policies to much more anticipation what could happen and to deal with much better with all these uh, interrelated and connected uncertainties that are emerging in this context. And in this slide, I propose an idea and concept of post-normal uh, politics and governance of uncertainty and risk that enhances or tries to enhance the uh, conventional and classical approaches of risk decision-making, risk politics, and risk regulation. And it aims to provide an account of how, uh, when, and 
why elements, mechanisms, and the logic of deliberative democracy um, are desirable and necessary for guiding uh, the design of novel governance addressing um, issues of uncertainty and risk. Well, this concept refers uh, um, to earlier thoughts, research activities, projects, and uh, a couple of publications that Audrin Wren and I developed together, and I tried to advance that and extend that in the last couple of years, and which this will also be uh, my uh, uh, subject of research in the future. So this post-normal governance and politics is especially concerned with the relation of knowledge, understanding, rational and forward-looking at uh, evaluation as well as uh, issues of participation, public participation, and public deliberation of deliberation in a general sense in political practices. So it is about the democratic distribution of deliberative powers and authorities that produce epistemic knowledge, public reasoning, something that I call ontological wisdom, and I will explain, or you will see how I explain that a little bit later, and uh, a kind of forecasting and anticipation in public policies when addressing issues of uncertainty and risk. Well, I admit it's a theoretical conceptualization and that is descriptive, functional, explanatory, and normative at the same time. But it is not a, a, a purely theoretically developed concept in an abstract way or, or developed in an ivory tower. Rather, it builds on um, um, numerous findings, insights of various empirical analysis in different fields, different risk fields and other political fields over many years. And the proposed concept borrows and further develops, on the one hand, the idea of post-normal science, which is based on extended peer community and developed by the uh, sociologists and uh, philosophers of science, Silvio Fantovitz and Jerome Roberts, already three decades ago. It's about the extension of traditional uh, scientific peer communities and the involvement of lay persons who can provide what they call extended facts from their uh, experiences. On the other hand, I also refer to empirical insights, what is called super forecasting. It's a, a, a large project in the US, conducted in the US, and it's published in the form of a book by the political scientists Tedlock and Gardner. And in, in empirical uh, um, analysis and in experiments, they showed that the anticipatory capacity and competence of a group of lay persons is better than of a single expert. And only groups of experts and groups of lay people uh, can produce something uh, that I call uh, forward-looking swarm intelligence. So I use that word from the other sciences to, uh, to illustrate that. So to address these shortcomings and deficiencies in our existing risk politics and risk regulations at a domestic and international and even global level and be able to transcend the existing or established processes, institutions, and structures, I propose and argue for an architecture of post-normal governance and politics that is organized in a form of a functional distribution and differentiation of deliberative labor by assigning specific tasks and responsibilities to four major authorities. The first is um, a mediation authority, or in other words, mediatory public sphere. The second is the epistemic or an epistemic authority via epistemic institutions acquiring and aggregating knowledge. Then the third one, um, I call it an associational or ontological authority um, dealing with lessons learned 
from experiences of um, members of civil society, economy, and the political system. And the final one, the fourth one, is called teleological authority, uh, which is a focal point of public opinion and will formation, debating and formulate, formulating uh, forward-looking uh, goals and public policies. I want to make another remark beforehand, before I uh, describe uh, the four authorities. Um, it's about the relation of uncertainty and risk. Um, for many years I conceived of risk and uncertainty as very closely related concept, as many scholars in social science do. Um, even in the natural science, it's uh, very closely uh, conceptually related in that way. So Ulrich Beck or Audrey Ray uh, do uh, the same, and I did for a long time as well. But almost 10 years ago, I, starting, I was starting to think about more uh, the relation of uncertainty and risk in general, and the general philosophical and social scientific nature of uncertainty. So I began some philosophical review and theoretical reflections that resulted in a book. Um, it is entitled The Theory of Uncertainty, and uh, uh, it looks good, the, um, the reviews are good, so it will be published hopefully at the end of the year or at the beginning of next year with Rutledge at uh, Taylor Francis in UK. Of course, the details of that uh, the theory uh, cannot be explained here. That would need another lecture or even a series of lectures. But I want to explain very briefly my whole understanding of the relation between of, uh, uncertainty and risk here, because it has some implications. So I see uncertainty in, uh, as a universal in philosophical terms. And universals are properties, qualities, or attributes that are assumed to exist or occur universally in things, their relations, or the sequence of things. And if we recognize uncertainty as a universal, uncertainty is only present with other things, or is in relation to other things. It can accompany other things, or it can affect other things. So universals are seen in contrast to particulars, that's the terminology in philosophy, and particulars are something like a microphone, paper, books, or the desktop, so rather material things. So I assert now that uncertainty produces uh, a shadow that invokes negative and positive interpretations, associations, and connotations. And this shadow becomes manifested and visible, metaphorically speaking, because it's not really something that you can see, through, on the one hand, through risk and insecurity, and on the other hand, through uh, chance, opportunity, or even hope. So on the one hand, those who perceive the bright side of uncertainty are hopeful and confident. They are inspired and see an opportunity to pursue new possibilities of advancement or innovation. On the other hand, the dark side of uncertainty reveals opaque, murky, and obscure light. And this is often associated with risk, insecurity, and even threats. And in this slide, I propose a taxonomic theory of uncertainty. So I have four principles, which are the core of the theory. First, I suggest something which I call existential principle of ontological uncertainty, and that relates to the general indeterminacy embedded in the fundamental nature of being, human existence, and reality. And then I have the second one, which is called knowledge-related principle of epistemological uncertainty. That's the thing that we know all in our research, to which refers to the fundamental tenet 
that, that the acquirement and production of knowledge and understanding attempts to uh, produce more certainty, but also at the same time entails the existence of non-knowing and ignorance. And this is important uh, in, uh, a lot in our, one, in our research activities, in many projects we have to address that in a way. It's a big issue in climate change uh, science, not anymore so much about the analysis, but about the consequences of the impact and the implementation. And so it's a big issue in general in sociology and uh, um, philosophy as well. Then the third principle is a, a language-oriented principle <coughs> of linguistic communicative uncertainty. And that refers to the difference between clarity or distinctness on the one hand and obscurity or ambiguity on the other hand in language, in communication, this first, which also plays, especially for social scientists, a big role. Also when it comes later when we discuss maybe something like how do we translate specific scientific insights and understanding into public understanding. And then finally, the fourth one is called teleological uh, uncertainty. So it's a, I propose here a forward-looking principle which refers to the incertitude characterizing the tentativeness of any human conjecture about the future. So in this new, new view uh, of the relation of uncertainty and rest has some implications with regard to the architecture of post-normal governance and politics, and I try to emphasize that now when I describe the, the four authorities. So my first one is called mediation authority, and this is engendered through the public sphere, which is according to Jürgen Habermas, this famous definition, it's quite old, but just recently, two years ago, he renewed that in the same way in a discussion in the context of the role of uh, social media. Um, is that it is public sphere is a particular realm of public activity, public interest, and expertise that in a society that connects and communicates between uh, the people as a whole and the political system. So. We all have that in our democracies, often we are not fully aware of that when we do not research on that, but we are active more or less all the time in this kind of uh, 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 public sphere. So activities such as commenting, asserting, uh, uttering opinions, objecting, contradicting or reacting to what others say or write via various channels or media uh, shape public spheres and discursive arenas in our democracy. And it's a space in democracy, democrat uh, democratic societies where public opinion and will formation are formed and were conveyed via communicative action and uh, uh, discourses. However, the, the high standards of the public spheres are the Habermas are only met within the boundaries of our uh, democratic side societies, but not in illiberal societies or at the international or global level. Several scholars of international relations um, assert and emphasize that issue-specific transnational public spheres have emerged, and but they do not fulfill the standards of uh, uh, the normative democratic legitimacy. So most of this, what we, most of us will know who deal with climate change issues is that more or less not only the big research network around the IPCC of these 20 to 30,000 researchers, they also have created kind of issue-specific transnational public sphere. I think that this is uh, um, one of the best examples for that. Anyway, the mediation authority of the uh, public sphere is essential because it embodies both the socio-political underpinning and scaffolding of post-norm politics and uh, uh, governance because um, it forms a democratic 
breeding ground from which uh, the other authorities unfold and evolve. And the next one is called epistemic authority. So this concerns the generation, acquirement, and aggregation of relevant and uh, contextual knowledge, understanding, and truth claims in terms of uncertainty and risk phenomena and their social manifestation. It refers to the capability and influence of recognized expertise, competences, and skills produced by members, what we know as epistemic communities in a broader understanding. We say often scientific communities. This is a little bit different to that, but here it is uh, uh, fits into that, and epistemic institutions. So epistemic authority is an institutionalized focus where knowledge-related expertise is concentrated and accumulated by means of deliberation among scholars and experts. And for example, they are come out of uh, scientific advisory bodies or scientific advisory bodies for themselves, or institutes of higher education, of course, uh, but also independent research institutes, not impartial think tanks or independent state-run research agency, I would also count to that today. It is in, uh, in terms of more philosophical uh, understanding and interaction process that they subsume under social epistemology. Yeah. Yeah, this is a big new issue in the last 10, 15 years in philosophy and that uh, fits well with our understanding of what is going on, for example, in African epistemic communities. So the, the experts of this epist uh, epistemic authority um, determine what is true, what are the facts of the matter, or what is the prevailing mental and social construction with regard to risk and uncertainty, and what is the remaining epistemic uncertainty, or in other words, the non-knowing and ignorance you see, I often use here when it comes to epistemic uncertainty, Ulrich Beck's term that he invented some years ago of this non-knowing or non-knowledge. And how can the experts uh, translate knowledge into a public understanding? So epistemic authority is the best democratic method in the frame of post-normal governance and politics because it can identify and compile knowledge and understanding that is epistemically reliable in helping stakeholders and citizens discover the right political decisions. We do not have any alternative to that. And epistemic authority thus produces a cognitive and evaluative reference and meaning frame with all, which ought to be the uh, outset uh, and the first input of each political uh, process dealing with uncertainty and risk in public opinion and political will formation and respective political risk decision making need to be predicated on uh, valid and trustworthy expert assessments and judgments and lay persons, that's what we know from uh, a couple of empirical studies, trust experts whose beliefs and opinions are uh, plausible and reasonable. And one personal remark, the credibility and trustworthiness of epistemic authority, I think, is more important than ever in this emerging age of post-facticity and post-truth, and now you have read just two weeks ago, an article about your uh, Minister for Digitalization, how she combats all this, this uh, fake news that coming out of China into Taiwan. And I was impressed about these uh, activities here, about the dimension you have to deal with that. Then the third uh, authority is associational authority. This concerns a deliberation of groups and stakeholders dealing with the ontological and ethical challenges of the given uncertainty and risk phenomenon. 
Uh, these groups and stakeholders are viewed as collective agents of the society. In these deliberations, the epistemic frames of reverence and meaning structures produced by an epistemic authority provide a common cognitive and evaluation stock of knowledge and understanding about causal, so cause-effect relations, causal beliefs and justified principle beliefs against which the ontological and ethical challenges and issues are considered and discussed. And so here, participants of civil society, economy, and the political systems uh, exchange issues and lessons learned from their experience in their life worlds in a more narrative way. And essentially, these associational deliberations concern the contextualization, so the ontological contextualization of the issues and the appraisal of challenges and issues given uh, with the given uncertainties and risks, and especially with regard to our social world. And that means that it refers to questions and issues of our and how we want to organize our human existence, how questions about the community, the society as a whole, or the, the com consequences of human behavior and human actions, our lifestyles, as well as effects of modernizations, and <coughs> more in general, the, the, the organization of our social being, including also issues like social welfare and similar. The aim here in the uh, association authority is to provide an ontological perspective and frame of reverence that includes the reasoning and interpretation of related concepts, values and customs, as well as ascertaining moral and ethical acceptability and tolerability. And it should also explain what are the remaining unsolvable ontological uncertainties because there is a series of that often totally neglected, but that is very important, I think, in uh, public policies for forward looking. So, associational deliberations also need to include debate and justification of what is appropriate with regard to ontological content because that could be extremely broad, so you have to define uh, the corridor in which you want to uh, deal with, and who is entitled uh, to settle these questions. That might be that you delegate specific groups of society to do that, or having specific experts even on that. So one could say that these deliberations produce a kind of, how I call it, an uh, ontological corridor with reasonable ethical beliefs and worldviews that include foregone conclusions and overarching aims and values that frame specific courses of action, modified behavior patterns, but also adjusted lifestyles or maps and, and uh, for transitions and transformations and guidelines for moral and uh, ethical commitment and social commitment. And this means that a cessational authority becomes a moral agency uh, of uh, the society because the members of society ascribe uh, collective moral responsibilities and, uh, to, to these collective agents. And in a nutshell, I would say that a cessational authority is essential for engendering and mediating a, des a desirable ontological account of our desirable modes of uh, human existence and the organization of our social being. And this uh, means, or in turn, uh, you could say that the members of the society uh, can uh, consider, and, uh, consider and accept this uh, 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 outcome of the associational authority as being right, good, and sustainable if it is in the view of the common good of all. Then my final authority is called teleological authority, and this embodies a um, focal point for the public sphere, and that means unorganized individuals of the general public 
are entitled to participate uh, in risk decision, decision making processes mm -hmm. by carefully considering, debating, and formulating public uh, risk policies from a means and reasoning and justifications via different forms of public deliberation. It is a democratic authority with a teleological orientation in that members of the public sphere can be seen as having the competence and are morally committed in, uh, in rationally reason and justify forward-looking goals and purposes and identify the means of achieving them. Um, it becomes effective when the public discourses and the forming of public opinion and will are channeled and aggregated through forms and procedures of public deliberation and aggregated. These kind of forms need to fulfill criteria that we know out of deliberative democracy such as a fair a chance of access to direct political influence for citizens and something like argumentative exchange uh, uh, should be, uh, can be uh, accounted here. Then public deliberations um, are organized as what is in literature called mini-publics. We know that that term from our Australian colleagues Godin and, and Drozek in the form of uh, uh, consensus conferences can be uh, named here. Citizen juries is the name for that thing in the US, especially citizen panels, deliberative opinion polls, and uh, citizen councils, which have become very popular in the last couple of years. Just a new citizen council, I think it's the second one, has been established last week in Germany on food policy, directly. Uh, advising the German uh, government, the German Ministry of Food. Um, this kind of mini publics or the different forms have been applied in uh, several countries, in European countries, in Japan, in Australia, in New Zealand, as well as in Canada and the US. And originally, I wanted to say that I don't know the situation in Taiwan. I still don't know it, but. I have learned so much yesterday that I have to list you here automatically of one of the countries which have a high degree of realizing stakeholder public participation and deliberation. So, and I hope we can discuss that a little bit more in a couple of minutes. So, the goal is to acquire this theological authority. Public deliberation draws on these epistemic frames of reverence and unique structures as well as uh, the uh, uh, suggested ontological corridor by the association of authority. So that means that citizens uh, would need to hear the evidence and learn of the reasons that underlie the issues and challenges from scientific experts of the epistemic authority and then question them, get into exchange with them about that. And they are also being presented with the perspective and understanding produced by the association authority. And here testimony from collective agents about the ontological reasons that justify moral and ethical acceptability and tolerability. In this way, that's what we, what we learn from a lot of uh, project is that ordinary citizens obtain sufficient knowledge, much more than uh, we uh, would expect in advance, and understanding as well as ontological wisdom or ontological sagacity, and be able to reflect and deliberate in a, in a forward-looking way. Yeah, that is one of the crucial aspects here. And I think the non-cursive nature of public deliberation motivates the participants to attain something that we call instrumental rationality, and that means that they are capable to formulate forward-looking public policies, engage the means necessary to achieve the desired ends, and also identify the teleological uncertainty that is always linked with when anticipating future outcomes. So, these were the four authorities. Um, 
At the end, I would like to draw some conclusions I try uh, to be uh, brief. I see post-normal politics and governance as a, um, a critical component of democratic and social progress. And maybe we can discuss that a little bit more later, what exactly that uh, can be. On the one hand, towards the advancement of our representative uh, uh, democracies within liberal societies. On the other hand, also as democratization and cosmopolitanization of international relations. And I think it's definitely feasible at a domestic level and can improve and reform conventional risk regulations and risk politics. And I want to emphasize two arguments uh, that are uh, not only uh, concluded by, by, by myself or by us, but you find them in a similar way in the, in the, theory, uh, in the literature. First is a series of scholars of uh, deliberative democracy and democracy theory and practice in general agree that the representative systems in our liberal democracies have some problems that need to be overcome in this sake of uh, the future of our democracies more dramatically expressed. So it's about the survival of our democracies. And many of these scholars uh, agree that it should be by enhancing uh, our political decision-making processes by mechanisms and elements of deliberative democracy and integrating them much more into our institutional and even constitutional uh, structures. The second argument is that some elements are, or processes of post-normal politics and governance are already realized in several countries, at least in part, even if they are often uh, too limited. So as I learned yesterday also here in Taiwan, I don't want to say that they are limited, so that is what we have to discuss but I saw that they are practiced here as well, which I didn't know before I visited you here. The problem is often that parts of that um, post novel approach are only practiced in a more informal and non-statutory way, and uh, um, that we are lacking comprehensive institutionalizations or constitutionalizations. And whether they are applied and how is, in my view, too much dependent on government's will. So it has to become something more just that is something coming out of the public will. And is, that's why I talk about the constitutionalization of it. So for example, although some of elements are constitutionalized at a constituent state level of the provinces in Canada, and in Canada and the federal states in the US, they are ineffective in a way because they are insufficiently implemented and often misused as what we call post-decisional affirmation. Nevertheless, there are dem I see democratic potentials and preconditions in our democratic societies that would enable a more entire realization of uh, post-normal politics and government. Well, I have to admit it looks different at the international and global level because it would need much more institutional adjustments and changes in their acceptance over a long period because intergovernmentalism is strongly holding sway over uh, international relations. But especially in times of what we just uh, are facing right now, decline of multilateralism the, the return of unilateralism or bilateralism, protectionism, and the birth of a new world order. I think a cosmopolitan and more egalitarian uh, vision provides hope for the future. And we need something like uh, a, a light at the end of the tunnel in which we can move in a positive way, not just accept the new world order and have no alternatives to that. So, um, I think um, this is especially uh, um, important with regard to what is happening right now, and I think it can become more than a realistic utopia in international and transnational level, 
And I use here the term or the phrase by John Rawls in his book, uh, The Law of the People, when he had to describe uh, the potential of realization for his ideal theories. So I think it's more than a realistic utopia. Uh, I think it's a realistic possibility for uh, the future at the international level, and it can be a kind of cosmopolitan counter-movement to the new contours of a multiple world order that we need, because it, it's moving into even stronger intergovernmentalism, which I, many scholars agree with me, have their, their limits, and we have to overcome that in time. I'm not talking about the next five years, I'm talking about decades in the future. So about our children, our grandchildren, and so on. And I, I'm optimistic. Just yesterday evening, we had this discussion about China. So I'm always, because I know Otto Renwald, well, he's always more optimistic than me. So, but here I'm optimistic in a way that um, we can. I'm optimistic because we can observe some transnational experiments of post-novel approaches already all over the world in different areas in different political fields, and I think and that are possibilities that should be uh, enhanced and advanced and might be what is important at the international level, much more institutionalized. Yeah, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward, I'm looking forward to your questions and our uh, discussion. I have some further readings uh, in which uh, issues of that presentation have earlier stages of development and uh, yeah. Well, now I return to my seat. So because that is a very social scientific uh, methodology uh, discussion, so uh, let me briefly give uh, some summary from my brain, yeah. Maybe my brain is different than He Minxiu and uh, Yang Ziyuan, <laughs> okay. First of all, actually, the, uh, I think since 1960, 1970, the whole world is going through uncertainty. Technological uncertainty, environmental uncertainty, such as climate change. So climate change issue actually emerged, yeah. Uh, about from 1970, 1960, remember uh, 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 Rome Clark, Loma Gia Bull, uh, contributor, one very important book called We Have Only One Earth in 1970, okay? And uh, after 1990s, we faced lots of the scientific or technological uncertainties, such as GMO, okay? Such as GMO, stem cell, or the way in Taiwan we meet a lot of the food, uh, BSE, okay, BSE issue, and then uh, nuclear power issue, and then later, yeah, climate change issue, or COVID-19, and uh, uh, ep epidemic uh, issue, or the now is a pandemic issue, air pollution issue, all of the issues are uh, actually the, that the, the human being uh, meeting a lot of uncertainty. And uh, uh, in, my, in my view, just before 1990s, okay, the whole world actually, the, how do you expert about how the part making uh, uh, conduct uh, actually, uh, uh, the normal base is by the uh, post uh, uh, mystic. Uh, scientific assessment by the uh, quantitative analysis, okay? So the whole world actually uh, making this, so uh, the governmental ministries organize expert committee, okay? With the expert, uh, they conduct a lot of assessment with, uh, with quantitative analysis, with quantitative risk assessment. Uh, to give to the uh, authority, to give to the yeah, policymaker, and uh, they, then they try to persuade the public, okay, this is the, the answer, this is the best policy we conduct. But that is no way, because all of the kinds, all of those kinds of the risk communication actually cannot persuade the public. So we see that would be a lot of the debate. So we call it the deliberative democracy yeah, coming out. 
So okay. So this is an important term. This is very important term. So later uh, in the uh, 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 scientific uh, philosophy of the scientific epistemology, yeah, uh, a, a, a very important uh, approach we call it post-normal science, which is actually the, uh, engage more uh, uh, quali qualitative assessment in order to improve the yeah, policy making. Yeah, besides uh, beside quantitative assessment, as I, I said earlier. So that is actually a very important approach. And the Professor uh, uh, Klinker yeah, today uh, gave us uh, this term post-normal past. Maybe he can yeah, explain it later yeah, clearly. And in my way, I think that is very important. What we from way back then is that when the world meet risk society, meet a lot of uncertainty, how can we actually yeah, to, uh, uh, take the solution yeah, uh, to uh, to those of the challenge. So you know that in that time, we had a lot of social movement, environment movement. We people, yeah, claimed yeah, uh, scientific democracy or the technological de democracy. So STS in Taiwan is very active. In Asia, is is very active. And then later, uh, uh, we also transplant a lot of the deliberative democracy, such as consensus conference, public conference, since 2000 in Taiwan, either in South Korea or Japan. Okay? 共识会议,我们台湾从两千年以后就开了好多共识会议,什么公民会议。But uh, I'm skeptical to whether this kind of uh, uh, deliberative democracy institution actually change our policy-making mode yeah, by the, our uh, so-called uh, authoritarian or developmental state yeah, regime. Okay, this is a very important question. So then go to uh, Professor Klinker's yeah, slide. We see he actually uh, try to uh, firstly try to actually dis distinguish a different kinds of the uncertainty. What he calls the ontological uncertainty. I think this term is very important and uh, proposed by. Uh, Anthony Giddens earlier, and then way back, yeah, in the 1990s, I remember. And then he uh, actually uh, also uh, uh, proposed the, the concept of epistemology uncertainty and uh, linguistic communicative uncertainty and uh, theological uh, uncertainty. I think this is uh, very important uh, to facilitate us to actually to catch uh, how can we actually uh, theoretically or methodically to actually to uh, catch all uh, those kinds of the, uh, concept or uh, actually how can we uh, by methodology how can we uh, tackle the uncertainty? So one way is the deliberation. So actually, the, by these the kinds of the distinguished of the four. Uncertainty, Professor uh, Klinker give us some solution. The first solution is the medi uh, medi uh, mediatory uh, public sphere, and the, the second is epistemology authority, and the, the third one is association authority, and the, the fourth is theological authority. I think this is the point of today we can discuss. And the, by those kinds of the authority, let me uh, remember that what actually we also uh, in introduced con some concept from Shira uh, Jason and Hegan uh, uh, Wharton. Yeah. We actually uh, in 2010 we invited Shira Jason uh, uh, come to Taiwan University and uh, actually she she proposed uh, the, the concept uh, civic epistemology to address uh, how can the public uh, uh, by a demo democratic institution to join the debate of the public issue. Okay, this is very important. Uh, and uh, what a pity in Germany, I say later. Okay, what a pity. We, we actually don't have a very uh, formal democratic uh, institution. Uh, formally we had, uh, but that, okay. 
And the secondly, uh, by the Hagano Waterney, yes, she also proposed a very important concept called socially robust knowledge. Uh, uh, that is to say that, that uh, the public, the, against expert, uh, the civil society can construct a uh, different uh, risk knowledge to challenge the policy making uh, by the government, uh, to challenge the uh, policy discourse by the government. Okay, so this is actually occurred in anti guoguang petrochemical uh, movement. Okay, actually, we actually create, construct a lot of the uh, risk knowledge or risk cost to challenge the governmental uh, policy basis. So we overturn this, uh, this, 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 this construction project. So this is very important. And to the final, I think quite important is the uh, Although Professor uh, Klinkert uh, today did not mention too much about the uh, cosmopolitanism, and uh, as what I uh, earlier said, uh, this is a, a, a opportunity, a chance uh, to Taiwan. Uh, in the, actually, in the real international uh, relation, relationship or international relationship, we call that it is the uh, realism of the international relationship. Uh, Taiwan would be, you know, squares, okay, with without yeah formal uh, uh, membership of the United Nations. So we are actually meet a lot of the obstacle, obstacle yeah, by many China. But actually, the, when we see climate change, okay, energy transition, nuclear issue, nuclear waste, nuclear waste water, yeah, okay, okay air pollution, even now with the AI, all is uncertainty in the new world. And uh, all the issue is actually cosmopolitanization. Uh, cosmopolitanization. 事實上,它不會變成現實國際關係主義而已,它會變成是世界所有的公民,每個民眾都會面對,都會遇到問題。所以這個在這個cosmopolitanization裡邊,台灣是有機會去貢獻的。所以by border, if uh, Professor Klinkert's uh, proposed uh, uh, possibility for a uh, future as alternative to Intergovernmentalism. Okay, I think we can also contribute. Taiwanese can contribute by the cosmopolitanization, by those kinds of issues: climate change, again, energy transition, nuclear, air, nuclear yeah, debate, air pollution, AI, such a lot of things. And uh, we can have to actually the, in the cosmopolitanization, we can meet cosmopolitan realism or cosmopolitan constructivism. By the cosmopolitan realism, because it's a real, it's a real, uh, it's, it's really, it, I will, it's really occurred. 它正在發生, and the 持續在發生, 所以它是一個現實的, 哦, 實在的, 正在發生, but we can actually uh, engage in more cosmopolitan constructivism. 我們可以去建構我們台灣對全世界的貢獻,這就是一個世界主義的建構主義。那 this is also a debate, yeah, by very bad. Uh between cosmopolitan realism and the cosmopolitan constructivism. So we Taiwan or the some middle small country, yeah, can have their own sound. Okay? They can have their own sound to to tell the whole world. Uh, we, what is the sustainability by our own country, our own society, our own community? So I think I try to connect uh, so, so uh, a little academic debate to the uh, real, uh, real, yeah, real occurrence of the technological or the, you know, the, the modern uncertainty and society. So we may we may to, to uh, take some way. Yeah. And try to tackle those kinds of uh, very complicated and complex uh, questions.